Well, Dr. Loritz, thank you so much for joining me in this episode of Lynch with a Leader. It is an honor to have you. <laughs> Well, it's a joy to be with you, my friend. I've been looking forward to this. Well, I have too. I have followed you from afar and just respect the heck out of you and yeah. love what you do. You 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 sort of cross into all kinds of sectors and are really from everybody's vantage point, you're a great leader. Did you see that did you see that in yourself when you were growing up? in New Jersey. Did you think one day, <laughs> man, one day I'm going to be a leader to talk, talk, take me back no, to your journey a little bit. No, not, not at all. Not at all. I just, uh, you know, did what I did, what came next, you know, mm. um, as a kid and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I did well in school and, you know, hindsight is 2020 vision. And, and of course, as I look back, I, I could see the hand of God orchestrating my life and, uh, positions of influence and leadership and that kind of thing. But, no, I mean, I was just in the moment uh, doing what came next and, you know, trying not to get in trouble with my parents. <laughs> and so, you know, just like everybody else. And uh, but you know what, Mike, I tell you, people um, saw things in me as I was growing up that I didn't see in myself mm. and uh, which uh, which became a life pattern for me. I just look over my life and at strategic moments, uh, God would bring it, particularly men into my life uh, that, that poured into me to get to the next level. So, you know, I don't think there's any such thing as a self-made man or self-made leader. Amen. You, you look back at your journey, Dr. Loritz, do you wonder where you would be if God hadn't have orchestrated that and he hadn't have sent those men who spoke life into you? Let's say you replaced yeah. them with a group of people that didn't speak like they spoke death into uh, you. Where, where do you think you would be? What would be different about your life if you hadn't have rubbed shoulders with some of the men that you rubbed shoulders with? Uh, I, it, there's no telling, man. And I, I think all of us, and Mike, you're the same way, man. I, it, you know, What's the old line? If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't climb up there. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I look over my life. I, you know, why why was I born in the central ward of Newark, New Jersey, with two parents in the household mm -hmm. who loved me, who modeled those things? You know, I, I you, know, you know, one of the problems with pride and arrogance is that when you stop to think about it, it is asininely stupid. You know, because most of us are taking pride over things we had no control over. That's right. And God just orchestrated our lives. So I am profoundly, profoundly grateful. And uh, and for those of us who were placed on third base, don't act like you were, you know, you hit a triple, brother. Somebody dropped you there, man. And That's so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I just uh, am so grateful for what God's given to me. What was the best thing your parents deposited in you? So you had a mom and dad oh, in that home. Yeah. What did they, what deposit did they put in you that you would say has paid the most dividends? Wow. You know, uh, there's so many of them. I would say that the greatest deposit was the portrait of who they were. They, my parents, you know, they weren't perfect. They weren't the fourth members of the Trinity, <laughs> you know, but they modeled the portrait of the, de of the desired destination at which me and my sisters should arrive. Mm -hmm. Again, they weren't perfect, um, but, you know, they showed up. Uh, they modeled integrity. Um, you know, they modeled those values in front of us. And so it was the influence of what they represented, that that uh, it was the eloquence of that modeling that, that really left the mark of me and my sisters. And my mother was a prayer warrior. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I could remember uh, as a kid, particularly a teenager, I'd walk by her room and uh, my parents' room and she'd be on uh, kneeling by the side of the bed. And uh, it does something to you when your mother's calling your name out to God mm. verbally, out Ooh. loud. <laughs> so, Man. you know, uh, there, there were times in which I was getting ready to get into some trouble as a teenager. And that scene of my mother on her knees praying would deliver me. Now it didn't always deliver me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time it did. So it was the integrity of character. That's powerful. You know, that's, that's what they deposit. They love the Lord. Um, you know, they, they uh, told the truth. They showed up. 
my dad loved his wife. Um, the quickest way for me to get in trouble, brother, was to disrespect his wife, my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, so they just lived out those values. That 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 was a gift. I love that. You look back and your parents had a faith. When did faith become yours? When did when did that relationship with yeah. Jesus anchor down deep in your soul? Yeah, Mike, that's, uh, you know, although I grew up in a, a Christian home, uh, the gospel didn't stick with me until I was 13 and a half years old. Yeah. I have two older sisters. They're both in heaven now. But uh, the younger of the two, we were particularly close. And uh, she had a high school friend that actually went to another church that had a profound impact on her. My sister came home and asked me uh, if I wanted to go to church with them. And I did. I was 13. My parents said, yeah, you could go. And I went and it was a small, tiny church. Uh, boy, but did the people love the Lord. And so the second Sunday in January, 1964, I don't even remember what my pastor preached on. I don't remember what he said. But he gave an invitation, and uh, I came forward. But I do remember him kneeling over me and say, said to me, son, what is it you want from God? And I said, sir, I'd like, like to get saved. I'd like to give my heart to Jesus. And he led me to Jesus. And mm -hmm. so I was 13 and a half years old. That's when it all started. And uh, my parents, to their credit, they, they allowed me to, to continue going to that church. Wow. And uh, it was a sweet place, tiny place. Never had more than, uh, I'd say, a good Sunday was 100 people in there. But usually it was somewhere between 50, 60 folks showing up. Bivocational pastor that loved Jesus and loved young people. And uh, and I began to grow. And they loved on me. And uh, he nurtured my life. And, you know, I, I tear up when I think about him right now because I, I stand on his shoulders. And I tell younger pastors all the time that size is overrated in terms yeah. of churches. Amen. It's not how many uh, seeds are in an apple. It's how many apples are in a seed. And so he was a great one. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a powerful statement right there. Yeah. It, you when you think about that time and in, in where we are, we're going to dive in your book here in just a second. From the moment you met Jesus to today, mm. how would you describe that journey? What's that journey been like for you? Oh, Wow. You know, so um, the foundation is everything. OK, um, uh, somehow in those early years when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, uh, I had some key people that come into my life that challenged me about praying for God's will in my life, about uh, valuing the scriptures and reading it every day um, and spending time in prayer on a daily basis. Those foundational things are everything. And I, I trace back, uh, I, with all that God's done in my life, I trace that back to those early years of, uh, of being poured into, exercising those disciplines, and that served as a foundation of my life. Now, you know, all Christian growth is not just one straight shot. That's and, right. And there have, been, there have been challenges and there are setbacks, and particularly my early, earlier years. But... Um, I have to say, I'm the product of people who have surrounded me. Wow. And uh, and because of that, and their loving encouragement in my life, I, I always had this sense of I never wanted to do anything to violate their trust and what they had given to me. And uh, again, I'm not perfect, Mike, and I, I've, I've made my, my, my share of mistakes. But I think early on, I, I appreciated... Uh, uh, the value of accountability and the value of people in my life always. And, uh, and I share that, that with younger leaders now, like, look, you never follow anybody. That's not following somebody. Amen. Uh, Amen. It's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing. And that you, you always need these kind of, these three people in your life, particularly if you are a pastor or any leader, you know, you need a, a Joab, somebody that will go to battle for you. You know, you need a Jonathan that will love you unconditionally. And then you need a Nathan in your life that would mm -hmm. tell you when you're stupid. And uh, <laughs> you know, well said, well said, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I, it's it's just been a journey. And, you know, I'm the product of great friends and uh, 
uh, you know, I had some, I had some bad experiences along the way. You learn through failure too. And like I used to tell my sons, especially we've got two sons and two daughters, but, but particularly those knucklehead boys, I used to tell them all the time and say, hey, look, man, experience ain't always the best teacher, but it is the only school a fool will attend. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're, you, you've you been admitted long before you thought you were. I oh, yeah, brother. That. Oh, that is so good. And what I love about your stories, you, you go off, you go to university, and while you're off at college, you meet the love of your life. Oh, you my meet gosh. Karen, and, and yes. you guys have been blessed now with yeah. children. And was it eleven grandchildren? Is that right? Eleven grandchildren. Eleven right. grandchildren. What has she provided? Most people won't know. Oh, her. They read gosh. your books. What has she provided you that nobody else would ever know? Oh my goodness, uh, Mike! You know you're asking me these tearjerker questions, man. I, uh, my wife is my hero. She's my hero, man. You know, um, boy, I can do this. Mm. She she was born into a single parent household. Um, her mother was a teenage unwed mother, um, and as a young teenager, she came to Jesus at at a small church there in in uh, Germantown section of Philadelphia, and these people loved her and poured into her. Um, she saw models of godly marriages and God created in her a passion to, to walk with the Lord. And, uh, we've been married now for 52 years and she, uh, every single day of her life, you know, people say nice things about me now because they don't know any better, but, <laughs> uh, you know, about my accomplishments and this, and they ask me all the time, it's about my, our kids, they love the Lord. And, uh, they're walking with the Lord. And, and by the way, I tell them all the time, Hey, look, keep, keep praying because we tend to take too much credit when our kids make good choices and too much blame when they make poor. You're doggone so, straight. You're yeah, doggone so straight. The jury's still out. Yep. But I, I have to tell them, they ask me, well, what did you do? I said, you know, um, I'm sure I had a, an influence on them and they would tell you that, but it was more Karen. Her consistency. Mm, uh, mm. My boys talk about, especially Brian, our oldest son, he talks about getting up every morning and seeing his mother sitting there with her cup of tea in our open Bible and her prayer journal. Mm. And she does that. I mean, it's just as consistent. Just this morning, I mean, I, I'm sitting at the counter here at our house, and every morning, you know, she's up early. She's in the Word. And her godliness... Um, and she, she's a truth speaker too. Some, we have a residence program at our church and these young dudes would ask me all the time, well, Dr. Loritz, does your wife give you honest feedback? And I would tell them, son, you have no idea. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. But, so I've been married 32 <laughs> and I don't tell my wife any of my illustrations because she's always correcting the story. I'm yes, like, listen, yes, she's yes, like, that's yes. not how it happened. I'm like, baby, that's how I remember it. That's what yeah. matters. I don't even run that stuff by her anymore. I, I tell Karen all the time when she corrects me on a story illustration, I said, oh, my goodness, another <laughs> eyewitness viewing a, uh, ruining a good story. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. No, so she's she's been a great, um, a great mother. Uh, she is, uh, you know, she walks with the Lord. She's faithful. Now, she's not the fourth member of the Trinity, but yeah. – and. Um, you know, our kids and grandkids just love, love their Mimi. And, uh, so she's a, she's a gem. You know, she's probably never written a book on leadership, but what's the best leadership principle you've learned from her? Oh my goodness. Wow. There's a number of them. My wife is quite the leader. Um, she, um, uh, she is a loyal, faithful friend. A loyal, faithful friend. I tell I tell people, and you know, this is only half jokingly, that if Karen Loritz gives up on you, it's close to the Lord giving up on you, brother. So you, 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 you've done some pretty bad stuff if my wife gives up on you. So her her loyalty, um, her diligence, mm -hmm. um, you know, she is a she she is just faithful um 
her integrity is rock solid. Mm. Um, if she promises to do something, you can count on it. And uh, and then also she is, and I think this comes from her teenage years, she has a heart for pouring into people and nurturing them and discipling them. And yeah, uh, and uh, she's a truth speaker with her friends too. I mean, she's yep. not, she's not, <laughs> She's she's loyal, but she doesn't believe in blind allegiance. Yep. And uh, um, so those are some wonderful, wonderful lessons. She's far more detailed than I'll ever be. Mm. And, uh, you know, she shakes her head at me when she sees me. You know, my eyes roll back if I get too many details. She says, you better already lose your mind, aren't you? I said, yes, I need you to bail me out here. So. <laughs> <laughs> You've overcommitted again, haven't you? I've yeah, overcommitted yes, again. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, you know. which is how you ended up on the show, but I really appreciate you being <laughs> on here. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you have spoken in locker rooms before Super Bowls. You've spoken mm-hmm. in the Pentagon. You've spoken literally on every platform across the country about your faith in Christ. Mm-hmm. Where does that ability to apply God's word to those different varied audiences Mm. where does that ability come from when you walk in to a promise keepers rally and all the men are ready there to eat it up right back in the Mm -hmm. 90s to a to a group that's getting ready to play the biggest game of their lives Mm -hmm. in the super bowl where does that ability to take god's word and infuse it into all those different kinds of environment where where does that art come from well, I don't know if it's so much of an art as it, it comes from experience. You know, I, I think um, so early on, I started preaching when I was 16 years old. Wow. And uh, now I wouldn't listen to anything I had to say until about 25 or 26. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I was in very various contexts. And I tell younger speakers and preachers all the time, if you're going to speak or preach this kind of thing, um, just take everything those first years you can get any invitations you have you you speak at any any kind of group and what ends up happening to you is that you you learn how you've got to adapt um uh to those various to those various audiences and the other thing is know who you're talking to yep you know and stop assuming that because your style works on sunday morning at a church that it's necessarily going to work in a you know, a businessman lunch in some place or this kind of thing and, and, and understand who your context is, um, you know, and always, and I, and I tell this to guys all the time, listen, listen, when you're asked to go speak someplace, don't just, don't just go and give your little standard gig or, or, you know, little package kind of thing. Always ask the question, what's the objective of of the opportunity Mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. Your goal is to make that ministry better, not just you to stand up and do something that that works. And so how, how can I contribute to where you are? Which means you ask who's going to be there, what's their age, what are you trying to do, and this kind of thing. And then you try to design your what you're going to say based based upon those realities. And uh, and so that, that that's, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, and I don't know how successful, I mean, I, I don't know how successful I've been at it, but it's. <laughs> well, they keep asking you back. That's always a good sign. Well, sometimes they ask you back to see if you can get it right, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we don't give surveys. We don't, we're not asking why they ask me back. They just ask me back. You know, it's so funny. I was talking to a guy the other day and I've done a lot with the Falcons through the years. And he mm-hmm. said, what, what have you learned most about it? And I said, it stretches me. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it makes you, it just makes you better because. Yeah. Those guys, they're harsh critics, man. And yeah. and I love I love what you've done in leadership because for so many guys in the Christian world, in pastoring especially, we find our lane and we just sort of live in that lane. Yeah. But yeah. you you're you're driving on a big old wide freeway. You're in and out of different lanes on this. And it's but you never leave the gospel. You no, never leave. No. You don't have a sugar stick of just great mm-hmm. leadership ideas. It's all rooted in mm-hmm. scripture. So let's, let's talk to guys that are like you and ladies that are like you in business. 
they step out and they go, I want to live pastor with my faith out in front. Mm -hmm. What are spiritual battles they need to be prepared for that they may not need to be prepared for if they just want to be a normal everyday leader and sort of blend in the ordinary crowd of leadership. If you want to be spiritually grounded in leadership, what's a battle that they may, they may know need to know is coming for them. Well, they always need to assume pushback that doing right does not necessarily mean that you will be always be embraced. You know, you're flying over the right target when you're being shot at. And, uh, you know, not not that not that you become an idiot. <laughs> Excuse the expression, and, no, and you right. become obnoxious. We should be winsome in all of that, but don't be surprised if you get pushback. And I, I and I would say that 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 is the main main way of thinking. Uh, I think we think too much quid pro quo. You know, pra- pragmatically, if I do this, then this ought to take place because that's what I no not. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So the that's devil's right. not sitting back in his lazy boy lounger while. You just have a wonderful time. Now, that is not to say, and I want to, I want to underscore this. I think you know you got to be shrewd, you got to be smart, you, in, in all of that. And one of the things that I tell Christians who are in the marketplace: listen, you are there to add value to mm. that enterprise. Mm. Mm. You're there to add value to that enterprise. And so your aspiration as a Christian is that my character is always going to be greater than the platform upon which I stand. That, that is your aspiration. Is, that is now, a that's, powerful. Say that statement one more time. Dr. Well, Ritz. You're, now you're, you're not going to do this all the time because we're fallen human beings. But at least your aspiration is that my character is always going to be greater than the platform upon which I stand. And so you 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 want to make sure you want to make sure that you take take the stick out of the devil's hand uh, by your performance, by your attitude, by how you respond, all of those things. And uh, Christians ought to be ought to be inexpendable commodities of any any enterprise that they're around. That's right. And, um, you know, and this sounds terrible, but I tell our folks, I used to tell when I was pastor, I used to tell our, our folks, this, hey, look, look, look. If if you're if you're not adding value to wherever you are in your office and this kind of thing, all right, uh, take the verses down from your office or your cubicle or this kind of thing. You you get your act together before you start placing those verses up there, mm. because your performance as a believer <clears throat> and your demeanor as a believer needs to carry some weight there. So that they can't argue with that. It's it's the Daniel way of thinking. Amen. You know, and that that you know you 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 you're gonna be you're gonna be all that God has called you to be there in that in that that arena. Yeah. So I think that that's the first place to begin. I actually think that um, and then communicating communicating love to the people mm-hmm. around you. That's good. That you care about them. And and so that when people leave your presence, um, they, you know, I'm going to use a word here that's not that that we don't use often. When they leave your presence, they 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 leave your presence thinking, "Well, I just came in contact with that which is noble." And by noble, what I mean, I don't mean that you're you know you're some, but by noble is that which is refreshingly, consistently, always right. But there's. There's something that anchors that individual. There, there, there's a dimension about them. And so it's, it's see, all you bring to any arena in life is not necessarily your gifts, talents, and abilities, but what you bring to every arena in life is who you are. Mm, mm. That's what you bring. And, and don't get it twisted. You know, your character will feed your conduct no matter what your circumstances may be. And, and you know, and I think too many of us, and now, now I'm, i got to say this the right way, you, you need to hone your skills, you, your abilities. You need to be growing and all of that. But that's second. That's second. Um, you, you, need, you, you need to be an authentic man or woman of God. In every way. 
and so that you're you know you're serving the meals on clean plates right mm, mm, mm. yeah so that's right that is <laughs> that is powerful because i think we live in a world we're looking for a quick fix yes and nobleness and character aren't quick fixes no they're but, not no 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 you can't you see you know, I saw some young leaders the other day i said now you know, there are three 20-year periods in an adult life, right? This 20 to 40 is that season of learning. <clears throat> and then 40 to, to 60 is that season of leveraging. And then 60 and beyond is that season of leaving. And I don't necessarily mean leaving ministry, or whatever, but I mean the character thing. But the problem when you're 20 to 40 years old, the problem there is that you can confuse exposure with experience. Right. You can make the terrible assumption that because you've got, you know, uh, education, you, 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 you're you Googling all this stuff is at your fingerprints and this kind of thing. You can make the dash of the assumption that knowledge equals wisdom. Now, you can Google knowledge, but you can't Google wisdom, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Wisdom and character are products of an endurance ride. And you just got to you just got to go through some stuff to get there. And uh, and that's why you have to be patient with yourself when you're in that quarter of your life, uh, that God's forming a spiritual address. And the problem when you're 20 to 40 years old is that everybody's obsessed with self-actualization. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And the tendency is to prematurely typecast yourself. And you ed actually can edit out the kind of growth that you need. And what you really need to do is just chill, get the experience. You it's, know so I mean? tr it's so true. Yeah, it is yeah, so yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, I think of some of the harebrained things that I said when I was 25, 30 years old, and I think to myself, oh, somebody should have said, will you please shut up? <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, you, but you get caught <laughs> up in it, and that is for so many guys, that's their meteoric rise. Yes. And they don't know yeah. what to do with it. They don't know yeah. how to handle that. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's like a dog chasing a car, okay? Now that you caught the car, what are you going to do? You're going to pee on the wheel? You're going to drive it? What 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 are you going to do with it? Hmm. And so sometimes we get we get a the most dangerous thing I think for a young leader is to 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 get a platform that they don't have the capacity to handle. Whenever you put a wounded person in a position of leadership, they always use that position of leadership as a means of their own personal therapy, and they end up hurting a whole lot of people. When you put a gifted person, don't confuse giftedness with maturity. Hmm. When you put a very gifted person on a public platform, he's going to hurt folks hmm. because he, he doesn't realize that the power falls on the person and not on the gift. Mm. You know, God's been hitting straight licks with crooked sticks forever. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you it's know, so true. isn't that true, Mike? It is I mean, so true. Look at your life. Look at my life. You know, people give me compliments about stuff and, and you go, I look over my life, you go, you know, you know what? You, you didn't really deserve that, did you? Right? No, no I don't. So, That's right. But, but, but well, what I'm trying to say is that you, get, you got to get to a place in your life where you're most effective with your gifts, interestingly enough, when you're detached from them. Mm -hmm. Now, Explain, I'm not saying unpack, unpack that a little bit. So you're most effective with your gifts when you are unattached from them. When you're detached from them. Yeah. When you're well, detached from it. Yeah, unpack what, what, that. What I mean by that is understanding that your gifts and abilities, they're not a statement of your identity. Okay? They're not a statement of your identity. I get so frustrated when I hear some of these guys preaching on spiritual gifts as pathways to self-actualization. Your, your gift is a vehicle by and through which God works, and he speaks to that. Uh, but you, you're, you're the person that mm. God is using. Mm. Mm. You're the person. You're the person. And this is the reason why leadership is always prophetic in the Bible. 
is not performance, it's always prophetic, meaning that the leader has to be the portrait of the desired destination at which the enterprise needs to arrive. I've got to be, that gets back to the whole statement, I have to aspire, I have to aspire to be greater than the platform that I stand on. So it's not about me standing up there just celebrating my giftedness. It's, it's about me being a good steward of what God has invested in me at this moment in history to execute what he's called me to be about. So that's where the security comes in. Mm -hmm. You get into spitting contests and comparison games and this kind of thing. When you start, you know, just thinking that your, your spiritual gift is a statement of your identity and the stuff starts sticking to you. That's right. You start fishing for compliments. You start comparing yourself with these other people and you start talking about your craft and your brand and, and all of this kind of stuff. And before you know it, you look at yourself in the mirror, you're singing how great thou art, you yep. know? And and it's just, I, we've all seen, <laughs> well, it doesn't listen, end well. I <laughs> get it. The, the bad part is I can't sing. And I'm still, no, still trying to say that to myself. <laughs> you know, I heard Jensen Franklin say something really interesting on a podcast. I was listening to some, somebody else with him and, he said the the problem is we've got a generation now of spiritual fathers that aren't embracing the role that they've been given and they're racing their spiritual sons and they are not being who God created them to be. Yeah. Instead yeah. of fanning into flame the yes. gift in that younger generation, they're yeah. competing with them. That's exactly right. And that's that's what I mean by you know, when you get to that 60 and older, by, by your late 50s, uh, you, you, you begin to embrace the reality that you've got more on the rearview mirror than that's in front right. of you, right? That's right. And it's during that time, you know, so there's you know, there's, that, there's that learning in the, in the first 20 years, that, then the 40 to 60 is that time of leveraging. Usually that's when things are taking off. But when you can start getting to your late 50s and around 60, it's leaving. And I don't mean leaving your ministry or this kind of thing, but you realize that your role right now, whether you like it or not, you're stepping toward being a patriarch. Right. Ain't that many people in front of you headed toward the grave. Mm. You know, you, you, you might be next. Mm. And by now, you have, a, you have the mother load of experiences, failures, successes, mediocrity, all these things. And now you know the difference, or at least you should know, the difference between a trend and a fad mm, mm. by that time in your life. And so now you step back and your goal is to prepare a generation for a time that you cannot see. You know what is noble by now. You know what is refreshingly always right. It was right 2,000 years ago. And should our Lord Terry, it's going to be right another 2,000 years in the future. And you want to reach back and be a cheerleader. Mm, mm. Be a cheerleader. Nothing's worse than seeing Seeing a 70, 75 year old leader stifling some young man. Get out of the way. Mm. Get behind him. Love him. If you gotta straighten him out, you know, don't don't beat him up in public. Pull him aside and say, look, man, uh, you're full of yourself the other day, but I love you too much not to let you and here's how you could do better. Mm. And mm. I'm with you. You know, this this is what we need more now. That was the main reason why I re, I retired from fellowship as senior pastor. I wasn't burnt out. I, you know, I and none of that stuff. I love preaching to our people, but I had this growing sense in me that I I needed to get on with what God had done for me. I mean, as I said earlier, the Lord sent in my early life all these incredible people that believed in me, and they they are no name people. Nobody mm -hmm. knows that. But boy, they shaped my life. And so it's my turn now. <laughs> Which one of these turn. Which one of these seasons did you enjoy the most? As you look back and you're looking back in that rearview mirror, was it the season of learning? Was it the season of leveraging? Or are you enjoy enjoying this season of leaving? Where 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 do you find yourself in that? Well, you know, I'm enjoying this this season of um uh, they, they all have their joys, okay? They all have their joys and their challenges, I would say, you know. But I really am enjoying this time right now. I, You know, 
Mike, uh, I mean, and you, you've been there. I, I, I get more joy out of sitting around with uh, four or five younger pastors and leaders, um, just interacting with them, loving on them, praying with them, sharing with them, and this kind of thing. Almost than I do speaking to you know a stadium full of you know, fifty, sixty thousand mm-hmm. people or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done those things, and I, I just, I, I feel feel good about that. But I, I think every stage, every stage has its joy. The most frustrating stage probably was, you know, twenty to forty right in there, yeah. where you know you you got all this galloping vision in your head, and you know I've had younger leaders ask me all the time, said, "What would you tell the young, uh, the thirty year old Crawford?" That's a 73-year-old Crawford knows. And I, I, I would say, I would tell him this, chill. Chill, you, you, you know, I was full of vision. Yep. And that kind of, and, but you're looking ahead, and you cannot minister where you're not. Mm. Mm. You can't minister where you're not. Uh, vision is overrated. Faithfulness is tragically underrated. But faithfulness is its own marketing strategy and its own brand. Amen. So all you have is today, my man, and stop procrastinating your joy until things change. You're going to assign yourself to misery. And what ends up happening, I tell you, Mike, what is, and you've seen this, what ends up happening is that you start using people. You don't mean to, but right. you get so full of your vision and so where, where you want to go, you start orchestrating and manipulating circumstances and relationships, and that never ends well. No. And so... I think that 20 to 40 is a, for, for most of us, you're getting your education done, you're married, you got kids and demands, and and you're wondering how come it's taking so long for me to get this stuff done and, and all of that. And it can be a can be a headache, but that's when they need, that's when they need some patriarchs to come that's alongside, right. drape an arm around them and tell them, son, it's going to be fine. And God can do more in the flesh than you can do in a lifetime of manipulation. So sit down and be quiet and just enjoy the moment. <laughs> you know, and it's so hard because in those years, man, you got all the vigor and you got all the energy in the world. Yeah, you yeah, just, yeah, you yeah. just have some stuff. You know, I think back to to North Star being that gosh, I've been there almost twenty seven years now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I but 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 I began with Ike. And, and I know, you know, know. and that was my pastor growing up. And then we plan a church together. And I remember early on in those early days, I was sitting in the office and, um, it was late and he's like, go home. It's going to be here tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Ain't ain't, no, you're you're not getting anything done tonight, man. Just, just go home. And then I look back at that and go, would I even be in ministry now? If I didn't have that sage sitting yeah. in the office next to me to go exactly. i know you got energy mike but you got two kids at home go home yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly you know guys ask me these young guys ask me all the time they say well you know again well i mean what, what's the difference between you i say well you know when i was in my 20s and 30s and even my 40s you know i had so much energy i'd stick my hand in a pot of spaghetti and throw it on the wall or whatever stuff i went with it Yep. And now at this stage of my life, I got to think about what's going to stick because I don't have too many throws left. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. Oh, That's man. Fair. God, I could talk yeah. to you all day. You are oh, my. fascinating. Well, you know, so I want to I want to just we'll, we'll do a little flyover of the book because okay. leadership identity and I I love spiritual leadership. And yeah, man, yeah, you, yeah. You have nailed it. And you talked about, and I love this line, you said distinctively Christian leaders live and lead from these characteristics you break down. And the first one is not one that's in any other leadership book I've ever read, and it's brokenness. Yeah, you know. know, Talk to me about that. Well, Mike, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, both of us are, because you and I both know if you've been in ministry longer than – five years, you've come to the realization that over time, God never uses anything that comes to him together. Mm. I wish that weren't true. I wish that weren't true. You see, God is not into double billing. He does not exist to make us a better version of ourselves. He doesn't exist uh, to to uh, kind of like breathe on our career. Um, leadership is always about stewarding what God 
wants done. So he has to create a holy handicap and a leader that keeps them dependent upon God. And remember that you remember, see, brokenness is not necessarily woundedness. You can be broken. Oh, you can be wounded without being broken, but you can't be broken without having been wounded. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the two is this. A sincerely broken person has taken their hurts and pains to Jesus. And Jesus has met them there. And there's this, there's this reminder that they're always living in dependence upon him. Hmm. Now, a person that's wounded but hasn't necessarily been broken, they have a tendency to celebrate the pain a little bit too much. And they have a tendency to want to pull you into how they've been hurt. And there's not much of Jesus or redemption or healing that's talked about there. Mm -hmm. And so brokenness is, is God just taking us down. It's Moses spending all those years on the south side of the desert, um, feeling that he is inadequate to do the job. You know, it is Paul's thorn in the flesh that plagued him. It's all of these things that God reminds us. You can't make it without him. Mm -hmm. And so brokenness is about a focused determination to bring the glory of God into everything that we say and everything that we do. And so the very first characteristic is, 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 is brokenness. Again, brokenness is not a lack of confidence. Yeah. I would, I would argue that, you know, it, it's the same thing. Humility in the Bible is not humility. You can't be humble without being confident, but it's, it's a God confidence. That's right. That's right. It's the direction of your confidence. It's a vertical confidence. And and uh, some of the most courageous people I know are very dependent people. That's right. But they're very courageous uh, because they know who takes care of them. And so brokenness is the first is the first one. Um, the you, second, you made a, you made yeah. a great yeah. statement. You, you said brokenness is a dear friend yeah. and pride is an enemy. Yeah. yeah. How did yeah. you get to the place? that you saw brokenness as a dear friend? Because most of us want to run from brokenness. Yeah. When yeah. did you get to the place that you saw it as a dear friend? Well, oh, it took time. Mm. <laughs> I don't always, and even to this day, I mean, anybody who tells you that they like pain and they like embarrassment and humiliation is a fool, you know. But as the late Bill Wright, founder and president of Campus Crusade for Christ, used to say, you know, the truth of the matter is you cannot truly be humble without being humiliated. Mm -hmm. And and when when you when you develop, you, you go through seasons of your life and you see how God worked when you were over your head. And he kept you on a short leash. Mm -hmm. And you you had tears coming down your cheeks just before you went into the church to preach. And there are issues going on in your life. And God develops a track record of carrying you. Mm -hmm. So you, you get to a point in your walk with the Lord where you understand that I didn't ask for this, but God's going to use it. He's going to sanctify Amen. it. So in that sense, it, it, is, it is a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, associated with brokenness is, is the whole idea of uncertainty. Yeah, Uncertainty is a gift. It's a gift. Because it drives us to dependence. You know, and that's the reason why God kept uh, Moses on a short leash. Those 40 years. There was no scenario planning there. 2.5 million Israelites had to leave that leash. That's right. <laughs> the only thing he had was a, this, this cloud by the day, this pull of fire by night. And he said, well, when you see that move, you move. You didn't move, you don't move. Yep. He was teaching them and the and the people dependence. Mm. Mm. Don't make assumptions. And that's what brokenness does. Yeah. You know, so it, it's a good friend. It is a good friend in the review mirror. And it's yeah. a painful friend yeah. when he's sitting in the next seat. And that oh, and yeah. that's that's the hard part. But it comes into in your principle your second principle that you unpack is uncommon communion. That that 
a spiritual leader has a depth to them of an abiding. Yes. And it's what you talked about with your wife, with your precious wife, Karen, there and your mom, this yeah. abiding with Christ. Why is it so vital that strong willed driven people learn to abide? Well, you, the way you phrase the question is the answer itself. Strong will driven people um, <laughs> need to give up being strong will and driven. You know, that needs to be adjusted. Now, there's no such, there's nothing wrong with ambition, but a, a holy ambition is, mm -hmm. is, is surrender. I'm taking, I'm taking all that he's placed in me and my personality. And I'm laying it on the altar that he might, he might bless it. But you see, the reason why the, I call it uncommon communion, uh, Mike, is that, you know, I think people get burnt out in ministry or wherever they might be, not necessarily simply because they're doing too much. There's certainly there's a part of that there. But I actually think that people get burnt out in ministry because they're doing what God called them to do the wrong way. Mm. There's a lot of self-reliance. Uh, yeah. And so... You know, when God calls a leader, there there are three things that are happening here. When God, it, it's it's God wants him to. There's something that God wants him to steward and execute. There's transformation of the people that he's that he's uh, impacting, but there's also there's also the transformation of his, his or her own life. And so every assignment from God, there's a gap. And God wants you to press into that, press into his heart through believing prayer to get the resources to bridge the gap so that on your way to doing something, you become something. Mm. Mm. That's the reason why you've got to be careful. Uh, Christians have to view leadership and assignment differently. It was meant to be a primary calling for the same thing. I, I'm look more like Jesus because of all of these assignments he's given me over these years of ministry. I have pressed into him because I've been over my head. Mm. I've had to say, Lord, help me. Will you come mm. through? So that the story of your life in ministry really is the autobiography of God during your moment in history. And that's the legacy that we leave. Leave. You don't get that through just a daily quiet time. That no. uncommon communion is more than I read my verse of the day and I prayed right. and <laughs> headed into work. What yeah. would you What would you say to somebody that says, "Man, I don't have time to develop that piece. I've got just a I, I got a moment I can give the Lord, but I don't have enough time for what you're calling uncommon communion. But I want to be a spiritual leader. What would you yeah. tell them?" I said, number one, you're kidding yourself. You don't want to be a spiritual leader. You don't want to do that. Because if you give a dance, you got to pay the band. You know, you don't want to be a spiritual leader. You want quick results. That's what you want. But you see, but you see, you're, you're fooling yourself. You keep operating that way. Within the 10, 10 to 15 years, you're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to have a nervous breakdown. You're going to be in a fetal position in the corner of your office and you know, elders are going to have to come wipe the drool off your face because here you are burnt out. How's that working for you? Mm. And that ministry was never meant to be carried out in the energy of the flesh. And so <clears throat> you got to make up your mind. See, here's the problem. You got to make up your mind. You got to make up your mind that ministry is always only about God. Mm. Always only about him. And uh, God does not need my help. He needs my obedience and he needs my surrender. But he doesn't need my help. And so, you know, uncommon communion says that I'm drawing energy from him, too. He's empowering me. He's empowering me. And, uh, um, and he's giving me what I need to sustain me. And so you you have to be there. And you got to keep asking yourself as a as a as a as a leader, particularly if you're in the church world or in, in, in any ministry, 
what am I trying to prove? What am I trying to prove? Is this just some sanctified pathway to people pleasing? Is this it? Oh, who, who's my ultimate audience? And by the time a dude reaches 40, 45 years old, you got you to gotta settle that. Because it's not sustainable otherwise. It's just not sustainable. All these young dudes who are burning out of ministry, who, 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 you know, the churches are exploding and this kind of thing. He's a mega church pastor. And the next thing you know, by the time they're 55, 60 years old, they're found in some motel room with some, some woman or they burnt out or they lost their family, all this other kind of stuff. The process stuff is not sustainable. It just really isn't. So, you know, that's nice. what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, th- I 1000% agree with you. And that's why the, that's why the road gets narrow yes. and few travel on it. And exactly I think right. you and I have lived long enough and, and you're, you're a step ahead of me. You're, you're around the track just a little bit from me. I'm, <laughs> I'm coming up hot on your back, but I don't, I, I don't, I, you I don't catch there, you brother. For, yeah, I might know. I might not catch you for a little while. But but as time goes, you see the trail of bodies on the side of the road, uh, and what scary, we man. thought we yeah. wanted destroyed us. It That's absolutely exactly right. destroyed us. So yeah. as you think about, and in your last chapter, and I'll, I want to end on this, you talked about radical immediate obedience. Yeah. How have you kept that? That's one thing when you're oh, 20, man. but yeah. you're 73 now. How yeah. have you kept radical, immediate obedience fresh in your life? It's a, you know, I'd be lying to struggle. You know, one of the great problems as you get older, you have to be careful of. You got to be careful of, um, you know, experience is a double-edged sword. Experience can make you lazy, too. You know, you start telling stories and this kind of thing of what used to be and this kind of stuff, and you got answers. You got all those experiences that you can pull through. You can sound more spiritual than you really are. And I, so, I think the thing that has kept me—I this is this sounds so elementary—but my daily times with the Lord, my daily communion with Him, um, and 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 making sure that I'm always asking God, what next? What next? What next? I want to run through the finish line, Mike. I want to run through it. I, You know, finishing well, as my friend Mark DeMoss says, finishing well is nothing more than living well until you finish. Mm-hmm. It's staying in the moment. You know, it's experiencing him in a moment. And, uh, uh, and so, and then, you know, I, I remember something Dr. Bright used to say just before he died. He he died of pulmonary fibrosis, and it was a serious disease. And he would, I was, we were on staff for 27 years with with crew, and he would say, I was on the U.S. cabinet, and, uh, and he would come to our cabinet meetings in that last year and a half. So he was living, and he had oxygen. And he would he would call our names out, and he would say, Josh McDowell, Dennis Rennie, Crawford Rich, you don't have to be successful, but you do have to be obedient. And when your passion for obedience eclipses your desire to be successful, that's when you've made made the tipping point. And by the way, by the way, I would say you'll probably even be more successful than you can ever dream or imagine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's just continue to pray for me. It's a daily thing. It's a daily because I mean, you know the devil again is not sitting back while we just kind of do what God wants. Yeah. If I were to the last part you talk about in your book, and we'll end with this question today, you talk about a legacy of faithfulness. I told you I ran into uh, Miles, your grandson, this summer. (laughs) I know uh, Brian and I have been on a board together uh, up at Liberty. Yeah. If I were to sit down with them 20 years from now, and I'd Mm. say, man, I remember the day I talked to your granddad. I remember the day I talked to your dad, or I got to talk to meet Miss Karen. And I I remember the day I talked to your husband. And they were to describe the legacy of faithfulness you left. How do you want them to describe it? Wow. Um, That I did what God told me to do. And that uh, 
I love them. I love them. You know, Brian wrote a, uh, was being interviewed and uh, he said something when I heard the interview that just, I immediately burst into tears. And he said, and they were asking him about my influence in his life. And he said, you know, dad wasn't perfect or isn't perfect. He said, but I remember his apologies more than I remember his sins. Mm. And uh, the sincerity, I, that's what I want more than anything else. Yeah. And, then, you know, they're going to hopefully remember, you know, times of laughter and fun and all that stuff, too. But, you know. 